Stanley Love opened the trapdoor, which was in the floor, and looked down at the earth. I don't mean the ground, I mean the earth, the planet, which was 200 miles below him. And then he stepped out. Stanley Love is an astronaut, and he was just going to work. At moments like that, many astronauts suddenly grasp just how precious our Earth is. But Stanley Love already knew that. He's a scientist with a PhD in astronomy, and his parents were early environmentalists. And who better than an astronaut to drive home the point that there is literally no planet B? Um, the evidence for Venus being habitable in the past is, is less strong, but for Mars it's very clear that it once had running water on its surface. And for that you need a warmer atmosphere, right now it's a, it's a frozen desert, and you need a thicker atmosphere. And right now the atmosphere is like being 100,000 feet up in a balloon on Earth, you know, where the science balloons are, and, uh, higher than the altitude you need to be for your own blood to boil at body temperature. Right? <laughs> horrible environment you you wouldn't last you know in seven seconds you'd be unconscious brain dead from lack of oxygen in three minutes if you took your helmet off on mars um, and it's very clear there that there was a temperate environment not necessarily with an oxygen atmosphere but with an atmosphere thick enough and warm enough for liquid water to exist uh, in the in mars's distant past uh, venus the evidence is more circumstantial what we see is the leftover heavy hydrogen in Venus's atmosphere, and given how much light hydrogen we thought must have had to escape into space to leave that much heavy hydrogen, there was a, a lot of water on Venus in the past. Um, and it, it's possible that it could have been cooler when, this, when the early solar system, when the sun was actually only about 70% as bright as it is today. Venus wouldn't have been so hot. It uh, could well have had a liquid water ocean and a, an environment that allows liquid water. But those those two examples, every planetary scientist learns this, you know, in, in college, much less grad school, that those places were once much more hospitable than they are today, and it just went away for ac geophysically accidental reasons. Um, and it, it hits home that the environment that we enjoy on Earth today, that keeps us alive, that makes it so that we can be conscious for more than seven seconds, uh, is not guaranteed to us by the laws of nature. It's contingent and accidental, and we don't want that ball to fall off the table. <laughs> you made a comment that was also striking, which is that although the robots are getting better and better, we're pretty damn good at things that we know how to do, but what a human being can do. In, in what, in a minute, what it takes a robot a day very often? Yes, one day of operations for one of our robots on Mars uh, is equivalent to what a human geologist could do in one minute. That is, survey a scene, pick out the interesting rock from all the other uninteresting rocks, walk over there, knock on it with a hammer, and take a look at it. And that's one day in the rover, and that's one day for a human. And that quote is from the guy who was in charge of the rover. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't biased in favor of the humans. And he's a pretty reliable source. He's a good source. Yes. Yeah. Space is already used by the military for things that space is useful to the military for global positioning system, satellites um, observing our foes, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and those systems have been in place forever. Um, putting weapons in space doesn't make a whole lot of sense because there's not a lot of targets in space. There's nothing that we want to protect in space except those satellites. So I don't see the point of putting weapons in space when it's basically a great platform to look at the earth from, but there's not a, a weapons dump there or a, or a city or a railroad yard or a propellant plant. Um, so I'm less worried about that. It's a, it's a great platform for observing and a great platform for uh, the big picture and for things like global positioning system, which now everybody's using. And that Isn't it striking, and it just occurred to me just this minute, that the space program is, is, is uh, reflected in two objects that I carry in my pocket. The space pen, which was developed in part <laughs> right? yep. and, and the and the iPhone that has the, the global positioning system, all that stuff is is in it. That's right. right. And it's talking to those satellites. That's right. right well, now. it's listening. But interestingly enough, earlier we spoke of Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity. That's also in your smartphone, by the way. Um, the Earth's gravitational field makes time run a little slower down here on the surface than it is up at the orbit of those satellites. And if your phone didn't compensate for that, the GPS would be 
very inaccurate. And getting worse all the time, I assume. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it, your phone and those satellites have to know about general relativity in order to work. Stanley Love, astronaut and scientist. At this point, I usually refer to some other interviews that cover closely related topics, but we really don't have any other interviews that are very much like this one, and it's not likely that we ever will. And we're very grateful to the National Aeronautics and Space Administration for giving us the opportunity to talk with astronaut love. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Kemp.